Today will mostly be about um, I can't do it, eh? about random constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, and uh, we will see some connections with the stuff I talked last time. But okay, so what do I mean by random CSP? So there are several models of randomness. So for example. Uh, in the problem of two coloring random graphs, there are three types of models, for example, that one can consider. One is the GNP model. So here, the graph is on n vertices, and each vertex, uh, uh, sorry, and each edge appears independently with probability p. That is the GNM model, where we basically um, uh, choose a graph uniformly at random among those that have n vertices and m edges. And uh, another model is um, you know, random uh, delta regular graphs on n vertices. So basically, um, here you pick a uh, a, a random deregular graph on n vertices. And um, in all of these cases, the goal is, you know, for example, to, to, to two color the graph. Okay, so you have two color, you sample a graph from one of these models, and uh, the goal is to understand whether you can solve the problem or not. So, uh, so now let me focus for a while on. Uh, uh, random models of this form, but for uh, general CSPs. So that is, we have uh, n, n variables. We have a CSP of our choice. And we choose um, a, a random instance on n variables. with uh, exactly um, uh, constraints. OK? So let me focus for now on this model. And um, so there is a nice story uh, that people have um, uh, understood behind this model. And it's, uh, it's as a following. So let me draw a picture. So here, the, the parameter of interest is the density, which is the ratio between the number of, um, of constraints to the number of variables. So this is a density. And we want to kind of study this model, so how, how this model behaves when we increase the density. Okay? So naturally, we expect the, the problem to become harder as we add constraints, so as we go to the right. And we expect it to be easier when you have no constraints, OK? So, um, so people have noticed that there exist two kind of, uh, let, let me call them thresholds, on, um, on this uh, density line. One, one of them is uh, the satisfiability threshold, which has, which has to do uh, with the existence of solutions. So uh, on the right. So on the right, um, oftentimes, for many problems, we can prove that there exists. Um, uh, so, we can, so we can find a window, right? And we conjecture that it's, a, it's, a, it's an actual uh, point. But usually, it's a window above which uh, solutions do not exist with high probability. So if you sample a, a dense a CSP, solutions do not exist. While here, solutions uh, do exist with high probability. Okay? And there is uh, another threshold that has to do with algorithms. So typically, our algorithms stop, stop working uh, at this point. Okay? So again, this is a window. But let me think of it as a point. And um, while solutions still exist here, we do not know how to, uh, how to find them. Okay? So, uh, 
let me write all this down. So uh, there typically exists um, a trivial upper bound So there typically exists a trivial upper bound on, on this uh, threshold above which uh, solutions uh, do not exist with high probability. Yeah, so uh, I will explain. By trivial, I mean um, a simple first moment method, a simple application of the first moment method. But I'll account for that. So, then, so this is for upper bounds. And then you can um, uh, prove lower bounds for this, again, for the, so, uh, so there's a non-constructive proof. That, uh, uh, that lower bounds uh, this threshold, showing basically that our first trivial bound is tight. Okay, so uh, typically there is a a window that closes asymptotically. And the upper bound you get with uh, this first moment method, and the lower bound you get with this non-constructive proof that is uh, basically the second moment method. Okay. And, this, uh, and, this, and this bound is actually uh, tight. It closes asymptotically. And yeah. And um, And there are some typically simple algorithms that work up to densities that are much lower than the satisfiability threshold. Okay, and uh, we don't know. Uh, of polynomial time algorithms that work in between. Are these the thresholds for number three? Sorry? Are these it's this. thresholds for the simple algorithms? Or? Yeah, for every algorithm. But uh, simple algorithms do match this threshold. Oh, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a value on the, dens and of the, on the, on, on the density. It's a what? It's a, va a specific value. What do you mean define? You can define it to be the high, highest density for which there is any polynomial time algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Or you can define it to mm -hmm. be the density for which I can analyze my algorithm. Or you can define it to simple anything. Okay, yeah. So this is a value well, for which all the algorithms we know there's a value for which all the algorithms we know stop working at, the, uh, at this value. And in fact, there are, in most cases, there exists a very simple algorithm that attains this value. OK? So so empirically, yes. uh, if you look at all possible algorithms, empirically, yeah. you see what density they get, it turns out that a very simple one gets it as well. Yes. Yeah, so so I, don't, I don't define it with respect to the simple algorithm. I define it empirically. So this is where they stop. And this is just an observation that a simple algorithm uh, matches it. OK? Sure. So this is uh, kind of an um, empirical thing. OK? Yeah. So are your algorithms randomized or permanent? Randomized. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, okay. So this is kind of the picture that uh, that it's true for many 
CSPs of interest like JSAT, graph coloring, hypergraph coloring, and others. And it agrees. Uh, so actually, it agrees with some predictions that are non rigorous, but actually turn out to be true. I mean, at least empirically, from uh, statistical physics. OK. So, um, so statistical physicists have uh, come up with ways, with non-rigorous ways, of predicting um, uh, the behavior of uh, random CSPs. So they studied other, other models. They call them spin classes. And they have made predictions for, uh, for, uh, for their models that have uh, tested uh, experimentally. And it turns out that these predictions hold for a random CSPs as well. So you can see a, a random CSP as, as a spin class. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time explaining their techniques, but roughly what they do. So uh, there is a kind of hierarchy of, um, they call them message passing algorithms. And by, ana by analyzing uh, algorithms in this hierarchy, you get predictions for, uh, for several uh, phenomena in random CSPs. So uh, let me give you the, the high level and the simplest example. So here's the, the idea. So imagine that, uh, OK, so we'll focus on trees for a while. What do I mean by a tree? So what I'm drawing here. What I'm drawing here is what we call the factor graph of a constraint satisfaction problem. So uh, 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 circles are of variables, and like boxes are um, constraints. And uh, a variable and a constraint are joined by an edge if this constraint uh, contains this variable. Okay, so. If it happens that, uh, in a very special case, that the factor graph is a tree, okay, then you can actually uh, use dynamic programming to uh, compute uh, the marginals of the uniform distribution over solutions. for each variable, OK? So uh, if you want to, to compute what is the probability that this variable takes value x when I sample from the solutions of this CSP uniform at random, then if, um, if your CSP, if the factor graph of your CSP is a tree, then there is a way to, to, to compute this in polynomial time using dynamic programming, OK? Now the idea is, I won't show this, but Dynam um, uh, this process of uh, dynami uh, dynamic programming can be seen as um, as a message passing procedure. So basically, the idea is that each uh, so you can view uh, the, the dynamic process, the, the dynamic program process, as a process where each variable in each constraint holds a belief for what is uh, the current marginal. And it keeps updating it, okay. And the po so when you look at it this way, you can basically generalize this process to uh, any CSP that is not uh, necessarily a, 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 a tree, okay. And you, do, you don't have any uh, guarantee that, that it, it will work, but the intuition is here is the intuition. is first of all that random CSPs 
are locally tree-like. Okay, so if you sample from this model, a CSP uniform at random, and fix a variable, then with high probability, its log n uh, neighborhood will look like a tree. Okay? So the point now is that um, the assumption is, and this is the non-rigorous non part, is that correlations under this uniform measure uh, over solutions uh, decay with distance. So when the girth is, is, uh, is very large, then the, um, and the initial condition on the leaves do not play that role, they do not play a big role. So the, the kind of the dynamic program process will be uh, uh, you know, approximately correct. So this is kind of the intuition, why, uh, why they think that um, message passing procedures do not work, um, uh, so do work on graphs that are not trees. Okay, but this is of course non-rigorous, and um, but anyway, it, it does predict all these uh, thresholds. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, and then so the hierarchy is so so this is kind of the um, like the, the the first level of the hierarchy, and then kind of you can um, see this message passing procedure as a fix. Uh, uh, so as a as an, an iterative procedure that tries to reach uh, a fixed point and satisfy certain constraints. So you can see, so you, you, you can see the, as an algorithm that tries to solve a CSP, and then you can apply basically um, the same procedure to the, to the CSP induced by this method. And you can keep doing that. Okay. Yeah? So that's what said, excuse me? What if you can satisfy every constraint of the CSP except for one of them? Then you will basically catch the. You mean if you sample at random? So, so for, for, for which CSP? You, what if you know, it's hard to find the solution to the CSP? Like maybe the CSP has no solutions, but if you could just satisfy most of them, then will this, will this uh, So is the question about um, yeah, well, what, what happens to. Uh, So, so, so the message passing procedure, so, so, okay, so solutions exist here, right? With high probability. Uh -huh. and, message pa and the message passing procedure, will, uh, it, this non-rigorous al analysis predicts that this message passing procedure will work all the way to this point. Okay, right. Okay? okay, that makes sense. Because if something is like barely satisfiable, unsatisfiable, yeah. it's been hard for message passing to distinguish. Yeah, right? okay. yeah. And the prediction is that you know what, since, this, since our procedure stops working here, they predict that everything will stop working here. Uh -huh. Okay? And uh, they actually, they make a more sophisticated uh, uh, predictions. So for example, they can predict that the solution space geometry of the CSP looks like a ball here. So basically, what do I mean by this? So imagine that for every, so what I'm drawing here with the dots is a solution of the, of the CSP. So each dot is a solution. So the prediction is that this solution space is very well connected in the sense that you can jump from one solution to another by changing you know, the value of one variable. So it's very well connected. Okay, so this is the prediction. And they also predict that um, when you pass this threshold, this threshold, this huge ball shatters into pieces. So basically you have, uh, again, so, so now instead of one large ball, you have many um, well-connected uh, balls, but each, each, um, each two clusters, we call them clusters, are very, from, very far from each other in the sense that if you want to transform a solution in this, uh, in this cluster to solution in this cluster, you should change many, many variables of, uh, of the constraint. Local thing won't work. Yeah. Also, do you expect this on like, tree thing to be an expander in general? Uh, you, you should, right? It's like some sort of random regular. Random, random. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you expect 
right? Right. And besides that, they predict other phenomena too. So bes besides this shattering thing, they predict that um, uh, most variables will be frozen in the sense that uh, in each cluster, most variables should have the same value. So, uh, so if you look at the, at, the, at the solution in a cluster, like 90% 90, 90 of the variables have the same value in every solution of the cluster. So they are frozen. Okay? So um, they have all these type of predictions. And people have noticed them and actually started proving them. Okay? So, um, so, so for, many, for many CSPs, now we know that this behavior that, that is predicted by statistical physicists is actually correct. So the solution space does look like this. Okay, so their predictions turn out to be correct. And um, yeah, and we, and we yet do not know of an algorithm that can beat this uh, message passing procedure. Yeah. Is it supposed to be like melting and boiling or something in some big Yeah, so, so here like, um, so, uh, so here, so as the density increases, the temperature decreases, so things begin to, fro to freeze. Uh, okay. okay? That's the, that's the idea. Uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, okay, so let me say a few words about um, how one can prove uh, rigorously one, two, uh, and four. So for one, as I said, um, one uses uh, a first moment argument. So basically, so let's say that F is your uh, is your sample from uh, from the from, from the random model. So what you do is you come you come up with a with a function u of f that is um, zero if f is unsatisfied unsatisfiable. And um, greater than one if f is satisfiable. So as an example, such a function could be the number of solutions of f. Okay, and then you can get an upper bound for uh, for for this uh, for this sat threshold by you know by f by simple. Observation that, that says that the probability that f is satisfiable is less than the expectation of u of f, which is typically a much easier uh, quantity to compute. And with some, uh, so if you if you come up with a function that is as simple as this, slightly more sophisticated, you can actually get this is why I mean this is what I mean by trivial here. You can actually get what it happens to be the correct value. Asymptotically, okay? Does that make sense? Now, to get the lower bound, so uh, so this is what you do to get. Uh, so first moment is for, for the upper bound, and now to get the lower bound, you use a second moment. So basically, um, again, you come up with a function. Over your CSP, and then you're trying to, uh, to, to lower bound the probability uh, that your uh, uh, CSP is satisfiable by using uh, basically Cauchy's parts, which is the Second moment. So you analyze. Uh, so you analyze. Uh, sorry. So you analyze uh, this thing here, and one choice that gives uh, the almost the correct uh, threshold is. Uh, is to take um, a weighted, uh, a weighted, f sorry, so to, so, to, so to come up with 
a weighting over uh, solutions of, of, the, of your CSP that factor over constraints. So uh, something like this. So the product, so the product here is over, over constraints. I So, uh, right. Sorry? Which? Yeah, so they are, uh, so they give, they just give a window, right, not the exact thing. So the exact thing is not known for most problems. But uh, for case out, I think okay, for case out, it's known, uh, and it's due to um, uh, Nike's okay, Nike's son, Alan Sly, and uh, I don't recall his first name, but it's uh, his last name is Deng. Okay. Uh, so, so for case out, we know that uh, for large case there exists a unique uh, a unique value here in another window, and um, right, so. Um, yeah, so I was saying that uh, a popular, I mean, a, a choice that uh, for the second moment that gives almost the time to the tightest bound is, is to take, uh, so this is a sum over the configurations of your CSP. And then you have a, fa a function that uh, factors, so you have a function w that factors over um, uh, the constraint of the CSP. And you analyze uh, a thing like this, OK? Um, and I mean, it, it's not very, I'm just trying to give you, you know, a, a kind of a review of, what, of what's going on. And for four, to, uh, to prove that um, the solution space uh, geometry of the CSP looks like this, what people do is they use uh, transfer theorems. So they basically, they reduce the, um, the analysis from random CSPs to uh, planted models. So uh, where you know that a solution is planted and exists. Okay? So this is kind of uh, a very uh, brief and uh, high level picture of what's going on in this area. Any questions? Yeah. Here, yeah. So I'm writing uh, the type of function that people use to get the lower bound here using the second moment method. So, so your function here will be uh, a function w that takes as input an assignment. So that, for example, in case that uh, uh, the, the, uh, a truth assignment for 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 your formula. And it outputs one or zero. Oh, sorry. It, it, it outputs a, a positive value, okay? a non-negative value. And I'm saying what I'm what, I've, uh, what I'm uh, writing here is that the functions people use factor over the um, the main idea is that they factor over the constraints of the problem. Okay. So basically, you can so you can when you evaluate this. This is a product, and this makes uh, things kind of um, easier to analyze. Now, what is the exact function here? Um, uh, it depends on the problem, and it's not super important right now. I just wanted to, you know, to show you. Uh, okay. Can you say something more about item four? Uh, and if, sorry. So for four, I'm thinking about I'm, oh, I'm proving this picture here. Both, of the, both sides of the yes, both sides. Of the geometry, and both of them are done by looking at planted. So saying whatever is going on is similar to what's going on in the planted model. Yeah. So there is this. Uh, okay. So let me let, let me just give you some references. So this first thing is 
by I mean, okay, so this thing, all these things started with uh, Friedgood. Okay, so he's the one who started uh, looking at these things um, rigorously. And then this, this method for the second moment is by uh, uh, Cleopas and Perez. And uh, this is by, um, by uh, Cleopas and uh, Amin Pesan. I mean, Koja Glan. And this transfer theorem, what they proved in this paper, is basically that kind of the geometry um, around a, a solution, so the, the local geometry around the solution uh, in this model, it's very similar to the geom, it almost, you know, with high probability, it's the same with a local geometry in a model where you have planted uh, a solution. So, when, so, you, so by planting, I mean you choose a solution. So you want to say that 0, 0, 0, 0, I want to be a solution. And now you sample from the uniform distribution over k senior formulas on n variables and m constraints that satisfy, that have this all 0 as a satisfying assignment. And they prove that locally, from, so uh, that around the 0, 0 assignment, the geometry is very similar to uh, the geometry around any of these variables. And you, they can use this to, to, to understand these things. OK? Yeah. So this first and second moment method, then my guess is the boundary is really about, are they like so close? Because I'm thinking about like continuum, you know, not continuum, some trick subgraph H. And I think for that, like, you can't really get a good mode. You know, you need to get to like Janssen or something to get it. So, so, so the, the, yeah, there are, so the, this gap closes as k goes to, so for, for k sets, this gap closes as k goes to the infinity. Okay, so if you're looking at like a fixed, okay, I see, oh, cool. Right. So if we're like finding subgraphs also, it should be better for logic k. So yeah. Subgraph, like k. So this window is like little low of k. But, but actually, there is no window anymore. For large k, there is no window anymore due to, due to this paper, for k sets. Uh -huh. Okay? It's, it's an exact point. Yes, uh, so. But when you say no window, you mean what exactly? They have proved that there exists a threshold, a value, a single value. A single value? Yeah, so, m. right? A single value of m over m? Of m over m. Of m over m. So what, what, this thing here, right? In general, it's not a single value, right, on the density. In general, we only have upper bounds and lower bounds. Let's say, if you cross the upper bound, then you are unsatisfiable, so unsatisfiable with high probability. Yeah. I just want to understand that this M is, we are using G M Perez, exactly M constraint. Right. And if there is an exact int one integer M no, for which. No, it's not an integer, it's a number like 4.1. It says so the ratio of M to N is 4.1. So for case that the number is something like 2 to the K log 2, something like that. Sorry, over, over, over k. After multiplication by one plus e log one, or after? No, it, it's. One m over m is two to the k m log two plus uh, one over m, or minus one over m. What happens? It, it does not depend on m. It, it, uh, it only depends on k. So So for k sat, so for k sat and large k, there exists a value. Let, let me call it r sat. So this is a number. Let's say it's five. Okay, for simplicity, five of k. Okay, <laughs> and if you are above five of k, you are unsatisfiable with high probability. And if you are below five of k, you are satisfiable with high probability. But this is a number, and it's five of k. Previously, be, be, before their work, you had two numbers. You, have, you had, let's say, uh, lower bound of k and upper bound of k. And as k grew to infinity, this window was closing. But it was not a number. It was, uh, it was an interval. 
Does that make sense? Oh, it's a, it's a. So if m by m is greater than. Huh? Yeah. 5 plus 1 over n is not correct, obviously. Or 5 plus 1 over n. So any constant, first check the constant, then let m and n go to infinity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You say exact value into the ratio. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, wait, wait. You, you did greater than 1.0 over 5. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Sorry if I misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah, but, it, but it's. Yeah, so let me ask, ask you, answer your question. Because we think of n going to infinity, we don't care about, uh, about this uh, little of n factors. We, we only care about factors of, that have to do with k and not n, okay? So, um, okay, so, great. So everything I said, so this picture, was for uh, for random CSPs of this form. Okay, so where um, you choose basically uniform at random from all CSPs with m constraints. But the same so the same statistical uh, physicist process can give predictions for you know any random model basically you want. Okay, so it gives predictions for this and for this. Okay, and okay, so let me give you an example. It's not, is this a plural of phenomenon? It's a Greek word, this, this is a plural in Greek. But it's a, okay. Okay, so, um, so for example, so for example, um, in this, uh, in the GN D over, over N model, okay? So we know that the chromatic number um, So, uh, so when d is at the level of n, we know that the chromatic number is uh, something like this. Okay, but we know of no algorithm that can color a, a random graph with less than uh, so with less than uh, this many colors. So there is this gap twice there. Twice the number. Twice, yeah. And this, this two is kind of the same two that, that appears in the density if you consider the GNM model. So in the GNM model, for two coloring, the, the, the distance, uh, the ratio between these two values is two. And this is kind of uh, the same two, OK? So and. Also, uh, another example in the regular graphs. So, in random regular graphs, we know that the chromatic number is uh, uh, is, is this. Okay. But uh, our algorithm stop working here.
Okay? So, yeah, it's the same too. Okay? Because it comes from the kind of the same method. Right. Okay? So, uh, okay. So, so now what I want to talk about next, so now I have given you this picture, I want to talk about um, algorithm for solving uh, random constraint satisfaction problems. But actually, I will not talk about algorithms that uh, solve random CSPs, but kind of pseudo-random CSPs. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So my goal in particular is will be to show you a sketch of this algorithm by, uh, by Molloy. So, so Molloy has recently proven the following. So now take any, any deterministic graph of degree delta that is also triangle free. So this is the input. Maximum degree delta. Maximum degree delta, yeah. And now the result is, his theorem is that um, you can color any such deterministic graph using uh, using 1 plus epsilon delta over log delta colors where uh, epsilon goes to uh, 0 as delta goes to infinity. OK? I notice that this matches exactly the bound for d regular graphs. OK? So this is like saying, right? No, no, I mean the, uh, so I mean the algorithm, the alg because this is an algorithm. So this is a theorem that says, you know what? One way to interpret it is that the only thing that matters for d regular graphs is that they are triangle free, basically. So d regular graphs are uh, locally, they look like trees locally. And Mike says that any graph that is basically triangle free, not even depth log, not, not even girth log n, of maximum degree delta will have, so will have a solution with this many colors. And this is already non-trivial, because this is not a random graph. Plus, you'll get an algorithm that is as good as the algorithms we have for random graphs. Right, so this is pretty neat. Are there triangle-free graphs, or is it just like this? Uh, so, uh, for any, so uh, for any graph, I think for any graph with uh, you, you can ha you can construct graphs with arbitrary large girth and whatever uh, chromatic number you want. So. <coughs> oh right, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. You're right. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. But you, oh sorry, yeah. I thought you had a question. Yeah. Did that make sense? It's not the same algorithm? No, no. It's not the same algorithm as for random graphs, because this works on any yeah. on deterministic graph. OK? And uh, yeah, could have been the same yeah, message passing. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, the, the, uh, the message passing algorithms, their analysis is non-rigorous. But we have simple randomized algorithms, local search algorithms, whose analysis is rigorous. Okay. So it could have been that all these things work for, uh, for the setting. But message passing is hard to analyze even in random graphs. Right. And this local search things, I don't think they work for. Uh, the, the simple uh, local search things that work for random graphs, I don't think they work here. They could, but I personally don't, don't believe they work here. Okay. Are you going to show us? Yeah. I'm going to uh, show you this proof. And this is kind of the connection with um, 
with the, the stuff I was talking about last time. So I'm going to give you a sketch of this proof using uh, this theorem I was trying to explain last time, and uh, I, got, uh, I got everyone confused. OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But let me say a few more things before I do that. It is randomized, yeah. I should also have said that um, kind of uh, this uh, literature about random CSPs and statistical physics can be found also in this book by Montanari and um, Mazard. Okay. So I've borrowed many things from this book for this. Yeah. So um, okay. So before I explain kind of the description of this algorithm. Let me tell you, so, okay, so there is this theorem. So, so last time I showed you this uh, kind of general theorem for convergence of local search algorithms. There's a better one by uh, Dimitris, me, and uh, Alistair. So this is Alistair Sikter. And um, using this theorem, one application is that you can kind of generalize Molois' algorithm to uh, graphs that have triangles. So. Uh, Let's say that um, so let's say that t is a bound on the number of triangles the vertex is uh, contained in. So basically, each vertex is co is contained in at most t triangles, and then. I'll explain uh, why I'm telling you this. So, so basically, um, the chromatic number of graphs like this, so uh, each, uh, So uh, if you have uh, a few number of triangles, you can get something like this. Now, for any t due to our, uh, our proof, so if the number of triangles superpass uh, a specific point, then the constant here doubles. Okay? But this is not a kind of a so, so we believe that one should be true all over, but this is uh, not a random point. This is not an arbitrary point. So this is a point where this property stops being the pseudorandom pseudo property that explains the behavior of the G and DN model. OK, so, so what I'm saying here is that if you use this, uh, if you use this theorem up to here, so what I'm drawing here is, the, is an axis where uh, in the G and D over N model where D increases. Sorry. Okay. So if you use this theorem, then basically you can color random graphs like this as good as uh, the other algorithms do that, ma that match, the, that match uh, uh, this bound here. Okay, for this, for uh, for a window that's something like this. So between log n and uh, roughly uh, the one over three n log n, this property is uh, it's kind of the pseudorandom property that. Um, uh, explains the behavior, the algorithm behavior of uh, uh, of random graphs of this form. Okay, 
above this point, so above this point here, this property is still tight for deterministic graphs, but it, it does not do good for random graphs. Okay, so this property, even if it was, even if it was with one here, would not explain the behavior of random graphs here be beyond this threshold, okay? Makes sense. And now you might ask, and I'll finish with this for a break. Now you might ask, what is the, what is the correct property here? And this is a conjecture of mine. Well, no, not mine. So it's a, okay. So this is a, an open problem that I've been trying for quite a long, a long time. So, um, unsuccessfully. So there is this notion of code degree of a graph. Let me uh, let me denote it by C of C of G. That is basically uh, the number of uh, mutual, so the maximum number of mutual neighbors of any two vertices. Sorry. Yeah, uh, go. Okay. Great. So there is this. There is this uh, kind of conjecture by Vu that says that for any graph, the the chromatic number is at most C of G plus uh, a constant uh, K delta over log delta. Okay, and this is a, a very, if this result, uh, so this is a conjecture. This is a kind of very serious result if one could uh, prove it because it implies many other things in graph theory. So like the least edge coloring conjecture. But it also, if this k was one plus epsilon, this would be the correct kind of pseudo random property that works uh, all the way as long as the sublinear, okay? So this is... No, no, no. So, so, so here, beyond this point, this expression is, not, is no longer relevant for random graphs. So it is tied up to a constant for deterministic graphs in the sense that you, can do, you cannot do anything for the, uh, better than for deterministic okay. graphs. But it's not relevant to uh, uh, random graphs. So it overestimates the chromatic number of by, uh, by much more than what, what it really is. Okay? And now I'm saying that okay. kind of if you want a guess for what is the pseudo random property that holds whenever d is a little low of n, so whenever this prediction holds, kind of this is, this is a, a good candidate. This could be much sa uh, saving a two, okay? okay? This would be asymptotically better than, than saving a two, uh -huh. is what I'm saying, uh -huh. okay? Cool, okay, so uh, let's take a break now. So if you plug in this number, you get this. Okay, so why is this kind of uh, a sign for tractability? Is because, you know, uh, imagine that we had this recursive procedure that first colors the graph, everything in the graph but V, right? So, so this would be colored. What this says is that most likely the coloring that you, would, that you would get here would be a, a coloring that would um, leave some room for V. So you could color V as well, right? So this is kind of the intuition. Of course, the algorithm does not work like this because the probability of failure is, you know, it scales with delta. So you cannot do this recursively, okay? Um, 
Sorry? Like, like, you know, some, you're going to randomly color the other guys. You should also be randomly coloring B, and then, like, you know, there's more stuff going on here, right? Than yes. Yeah. Okay, so here's how you do that. So, um, so this is kind of, in scenarios like this, uh, people use this kind of roidal uh, method or semi-random method. Wait, do you erase this? Uh, because I'm not sure if it's correct. Is it correct? Two dots, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whose idea is the following? So the idea is that you know. Uh, Applied in this setting, it could be you know to color the graph in iteration. Okay, so uh, typically you will make uh, a few runs over the graph, over the over the. Uh, so so uh, what I mean is that your algorithm will uh, consist of. Uh, log delta iterations, for example. And each iteration, you will color some part of the graph. Okay? And while you do that, is uh, you keep track, keep track of uh, some parameters. Related to, uh, related to each vertex, some parameters. And uh, you make sure that uh, through your iterations that they evolve randomly. So, so let me give you an example. So for uh, a type of parameter for, for a vertex V could be the number of available colors. And what you want to make sure is that as you color the graph, as vertices get colored, V will think that this was a random assignment. Okay? So you keep track of some parameters, and you make sure that they evolve kind of pseudo-randomly. Okay? So, so in the end, you have colored uh, enough of the graph. Each vertex thinks that each neighborhood is colored randomly. And so then you finish the coloring with a, with a last you know, greedy thing. Okay? That makes sense? So this is the idea. And typically, OK, so the, the best kind of proof using this strategy before Molloy was due to Johansson that gave uh, an O of delta over log delta bound. Okay. So Mike improved the constant here. But his, his result, as I told you, is important because he found the constant. And moreover, his proof is actually very nice and very uh, very much more simple than this proof. So in fact, he just do, does one iteration. And then he finishes the coloring. Okay? So, so this is a, a, a general kind of method that applies to many problems. I try to describe what, what happens in this problem in this case. And yeah, yeah, this is what, you, what was used before. Okay? OK, so in, my, in Molois's proof, we have uh, one iteration. That finds a, you know, a good partial coloring. And then from this partial coloring, We get a full one. Uh, so this each iteration is a local search algorithm on its own. But when this local search s stops, then everything stays fixed. Okay. So this is what I mean by iteration. Okay. I mean you, you'll see. Okay. So what's the intuition? I mean, okay. 
to the, I mean, I'll describe the algorithm, but the, the kind of edge in Mike's result uh, the, uh, he used to, to beat this is the following observation. OK. So um, so now let's, let's say that you fix a vertex again, V. But now, for each neighbor u, you assign it uh, an arbitrary list that has whatever color, colors you want, arbitrarily chosen, plus blank. So blank is kind of nothing. Okay. So you, so here's the experiment. So you fix the choose adversarial or you know arbitrary lists for uh, each uh, neighbor of him and add blank okay so we think of blank as a color that means this vertex does not block anything. Okay? So now the observation is that if you sample a random coloring from this list, then again the expected um, the expected number of available colors is again um, the same as in the random experiment. So it's again like this. Okay, this kind of a um, magic. Uh, How long is the list? It's arbitrary. It could be empty, even empty, but blank. So it always has blank, oh. and then it could be anything. So did, did this statement make uh, make make sense? Okay. each vertex initially, so in the first phase initially, it has two colors. And we add one extra color, which, is, which we call blank, because we go for a partial, partial coloring at first. Okay? So the thing, the thing here is that, what I'm saying here is that in this experiment, imagine that each vertex had, uh, in the neighborhood had any list. Mm -hmm. not, not with the two colors, any subset, yes. even the empty one. Okay? So arbitrarily chosen. But it always has blank. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do some calculations, you can prove that if you sample uniform at random from this thing, mm -hmm. then, uh, then, this, then the number of available colors for V is, again, as much as you would expect in the, in the fully random experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're adding one color. You're adding a, a blank color. It's not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, it could be just blanks here. Then clearly, if it was just blanks here, then c so when you add blank, then uh, this everything, you know, is available basically. Uh -huh. Right? Okay. It probably will show up that often though at this point. Right? It's it, 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 yeah. It depends it depends on the It, it depends on this choice. Uh -huh. You can make it appear with probability one, is what I'm saying. Okay, sure. But this only helps you because it's blank. Uh -huh. So that's greater than eight fifty or uh, in the worst case they are uh, oh yeah, yeah, so it's, it's greater than yeah. Okay. Right. And again we're yeah. calling everything before V, we're calling V last. We're still we're still essentially Yes. It's the it's the analogous statement, but, but you know, for adversarially chosen list. Okay. So here's the parameters that we'll uh, keep in track of. Okay. So the idea is that we will um, uh, 
form a constraint satisfaction problem where the constraints are with respect to some parameters for, uh, for the neighborhood of E. Okay? And we will try to solve this constraint satisfaction problem using local search. Okay, so uh, what are the parameters? One parameter is for each V, we keep track of the number of available colors at a coloring, at any coloring, okay? So we keep track, let me call it available of V of sigma. We keep, uh, okay, keep track, we keep track of this number. Sigma here is a coloring, and uh, so this is a coloring. So this is the number of available colors for V in sigma. This is a partial coloring. OK? Uh, so the other thing is there is notion of conflict degree related to a color. Okay, so uh, TV of sigma is basically the number, is the conflict degree. So it's basically the number of neighbors of V. Okay, so these are neighbors. Okay, that uh, at half C in uh, the list of, uh, let, let, let me say that this is a set and this is its cardinality. So the conflict degree, so for each, so for each vertex, V, you look at its neighborhood, and what you count for C is how many, so each neighbor has a list of available colors. So it has blank and some other list for each proper color, so for each partial coloring, right? So what you count is the number of neighbors that have C in their list. And the reason, the intuition is that the, the reason that you want to count this is because uh, the, uh, these are the neighbors with which uh, V competes for C, okay? So these neighbors could potentially get C and V could potentially get C. So uh, you want to, to get uh, control of this, okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, cool. Okay, and here's what you want. So now you want to end up in a, in a so you want to find a partial coloring. Sigma star, okay, for which, for every vertex, the number of available colors for the vertex is at least, let's say, this much. Okay, so this is the first thing you want. And the second thing you want is, if you look at the sum of the conflict degrees, For the, for the colors in the list of available colors for, uh, for C, then this is uh, less than uh, this much. Okay, so for each vertex, you have two constraints. One, two, you know, two conflicting constraints. One says that 
I want to have many available colors. The other says, I want to have small conflict degree. OK? And why is this is enough to, uh, to complete the coloring? OK, so why is this uh, a good partial coloring to find? Um, I'm going to sketch the proof. I mean, the proof is just an application of the Mosler-Tardus algorithm. So remember, I, I've told you last time that you can view uh, the local lemma as um, uh, you can view it heuristically as a as a local union bound. Okay, so. Uh, so this is what I'm going to I'm going to use this heuristic to prove that this is a good uh, result, okay? So say you have a vertex v, okay? And this is its neighborhood. And now you have found uh, such a coloring uh, sigma star. Okay? So here's how the local lemma applies. So the existential proof is basically consider a coloring where you sample from the list of available colors uniformly at random, okay? And consider this probability space. And we want to apply the local lemma here, okay? And now you have one bad event for this, for, e for each edge being monochromatic, okay? So now let me do a local union bound to show you that uh, kind of uh, locally these things will work out. So, uh, so, For each color in the available colors of V, I'm summing over the probability of the events that uh, V will, con will be contained in a monochromatic edge of C. Okay? So, uh, so for each color C, there are at most the number of conflict de degree events, okay? because there are these many neighbors, these many edges. And the probability of each event is uh, because we choose randomly, it's uh, the probability that uh, V gets color C and the probability that the neighbor gets color C. And due to, uh, due to this constraint, it's uh, at least this much. Okay? So if you plug this in the here, you get that this is one less than over 10. So the local lemma applies, OK? So this kind of union bound, this local union bound, it's less than 1. And it's fact, it's fact it's less than 1 over 4, or 1 over e, which is what we wanted for the local lemma to apply. Does that make sense? So, so this here is the probability that an edge will be C monochromatic. It will have C in both ends. And it's the probability that V takes C and the probability that, that the specific neighbor takes uh, C, right? For this neighbor to take C, it should be in this set of conflict degrees. And because of our uh, partial uh, coloring thing, we know it has many choices. So this is where this comes from, OK? Mm-hmm. One over eight. Mm-hmm. This is for the neighbor. Right. One over, you're right. It's one over delta epsilon. And this is how many neighbors you have for each color. And you sum over colors. So this is like a local union. It's a union bound for the neighborhood of, of V. But this is what the local lemma is about, OK? That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. So this is the first step, and this is how we finish it has once. To be, and it has to be proper. It has to be proper. So and the way you define these available colors, you only care about vertices that do not cover. 
Oh, here? Yes, yes, yes. But you can show it for everybody, but, but yes, yeah. Right. Cool? OK. So um, So one thing to notice Okay, so now so now what is the algorithm for the first phase? So it's kind of local search. So with these constraints, right? With constraints, sorry, with uh, these constraints. So, okay. So it's while, okay, so start at all blank assignment. And then while constraints exist. So pick the lowest index one. And re randomize its neighborhood. Well, then there's no constraint. What's the constraint? Oh, so this is the, 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 initial, uh, col the initial partial coloring. Constraints of this form. So for, for each vertex v, we have two constraints. One constraint that says uh, I have to have many colors. Okay. So it's, 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 it's yeah, yeah. right? Huh? Yeah. So, it, so it's, they are not coloring constraints. They are this type of constraints. OK? And by we randomize the neighborhood. the neighbors, what I basically mean is okay. so what I basically mean is that um, so this is a vertex V and these are its neighbors and each of them has a list of available colors, AU of sigma, uh, AU1, this is U1, this is U2. Then it has a list. So at any given coloring sigma, OK, so at, at every state sigma, when you want to fix a constraint that is related to V, so you look at its neighbors. Its, neighbors ha each neighbor has a list of available colors plus blank. What you do is you sample a color here from these lists. Okay? So this is what it means to be to, to, to re randomize a neighborhood. It means a sample from available colors plus blank. Okay? So if the lowest index constraint, so constraints are indexed by, by vertices. And let's say 1 and 2, so constraint CV1, let's say, is this constraint. And CV2 is this constraint. So let's say you have an order over vertices. You pick the lowest index vertex that violates one of these two constraints. And you pick the first constraint between 1 and 2 that are violated. And by the sample, I mean, it, it randomized the neighborhood, right? Uh, so like, say you pick UI, and you, you randomize the neighborhood to UI. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. OK. So now. Wait, so suppose the second one is violated. Right. Since this vertex has many inputs in the neighborhood. Right. You resample this vertex, not this one. No, the neighborhood, yeah. In both cases, 
for both constraint one and two, you always re-randomize the neighborhood. You randomize all of the neighborhoods? All of the neighborhoods. It, it, it doesn't change that. So be, 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 because you don't take from the availables on blank, and because there are no edges in here, so when you randomize the neighborhood, right, you always pick from the available color. That's important. We started with the Spangle free, and we never noticed Yeah. OK, so you never violate the proper coloring because it's Spangle free. OK? OK. So um, when you give early, you can say you are not just fixing these constraints, though, right? You are fixing these this constraints. Let, let, me, let, let me just say this. So here's an observation. Remember this observation here? That with arbitrary lists, then the expected number of available colors is big. Mm -hmm. Then this is basic. One other way to interpret this is, no matter what happens when you fix a constraint, so no matter the, no matter the partial coloring you are at, when you fix a, a constraint of type 1, you are going to uh, satisfy it with good probability. This is what this experiment, this is exactly what this experiment means here. OK? So uh, let me, let me uh, denote this as following. As follows. So uh, the probability that a constraint of the form, uh, let's call it uh, CV1, is violated when you resample that state sigma is, you can prove it that it's basically one on one, something like this, which in particular is less than, let's say, one over delta to the power of 10. OK? It just so happens magically that the same is true for the constraints of the second form. The same is true OK. Why do we care that these are things are true? OK, there are, there are good probabilities, but definitely you cannot do a union bound because this is just um, in delta. It's not an N, OK? So here's where you use this confusing theorem I was telling you about last time, OK? So uh, so last time I was trying to explain a theorem for uh, analyzing algorithms like this, OK? And I told you that um, basically for each constraint, you care about this parameter, gamma, C of V, which is basically the sum. So OK, so, so first of all, you had, a, you, had, you had as input as an algorithm. And then you get to choose a probability distribution mu. OK, so in this case, the mu we choose is the uniform over uh, uh, partial proper colorings. OK? And then we had this flaws thing, which what is a flaw? It's basically the, so the flaw for a constraint CV, let's call it f of CV, it's basically the set of states, the set of partial colorings that violate uh, violate the constraint, OK? So this is what we had last time. And we cared about two parameters. Yeah. 
So the first parameter we cared about is this gamma of uh, f, which was basically this sum. So what is the sum? So for sorry, max over time. So now I'll explain what this uh, this sum is in the in this uh, case of, of Malloy Solgraph. So you so you go over all partial colorings tau. Okay, so this is a partial coloring, and you have a constraint in mind. Let's say C V one. So this this is the constraint that corresponds to this to this flow. And now you look at the in degree in this state. Okay, so you basically look at all partial colorings, so all partial proper colorings. So this is the summation here, sigma one, sigma two, sigma blah. For which, if you address the constraint in this coloring, you reach tau. So, so you basically you can go from sigma to tau by addressing constraint CV. Okay. And you sum them up. And what you sum is the probability of this transition weighted by this ratio. But in this case, this ratio is 1 because the measure is uniform. OK? So this is what we want to, to, uh, to bound. OK? Now, what is this? It turns out, and I'll very quickly show you this. It turns out that this ca in this case, so I try to give you uh, some intuition about what this in means in general. But this, in this case, it has a very concrete uh, interpretation. So F is exactly this probability here. OK? So gamma of F is ex oh, it. gamma of CV1 is exactly this uh, maximum over sigma. So it's kind of the worst case probability to violate uh, the constraint when you address it at, at, a, as, at, a, at a specific partial coloring. Is that CV1 or CV? CV1. Okay. And why is this the case? Well, uh, okay. Why is this the case? Let's see this picture here again. So now fix a partial coloring, OK? I'm, I'm trying to convince you that this summation amounts to this. So fix a partial coloring, OK? And now think of all the colorings that could lead to this one. What do we know about them? One thing we know is that the list of available colors has not for each neighbor of V. So here we're trying to fix a constraint that has to do with V. It has not changed. So here and here, so for tau and for sigma, the list of available colors for the neighbors of V are the same because we only re-randomize the neighborhood and we don't change anything outside. We could, we could do something local. Okay? So that's one thing. So this means that for all of these guys in the summation, this is exactly the product over the neighbors of the available colors. So each transition here is weighted by, by this number because we pick one color uniform at random. And all of these have the same, the same, uh, the same lists, which are the same as in tau. Okay? So let me actually write down here. Okay? The second thing is that um, we know that this constraint was violated there. So in, in all of these sigmas, constraints uh, C was violated, right? So what does this tell us about the assignment for the neighbors of V? So it should have been a violating assignment. Okay, so, uh, so a violating assignment. Okay, so and we have at most one sigma for each violating assignment. So, so each sigma here should correspond to a violating assignment for the neighbors. So in this sum, we will get at most the number of violating assignments for C, right? For C V1. And each one is uh, each one is a, 
uh, weighted by this thing. But this is exactly the probability that uh, uh, CV is violated at all when you resample randomly. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a concrete application of this weird theorem I was telling you last time. And one other way to see it is that um, you try to measure the, um, the discrepancy between the actions of the algorithm and, uh, and new. So in particular, this can be seen as also as the probability. So this, it turns out to be equal, but it's not as simple as to see. It turns out to be equal the probability that CV1 is violated if we condition kind of uh, in a worst case, so in a worst case assignment coloring in the rest of the graph. So if you sample from new and you have fixed the, so if you sample from new and you have fixed the coloring in the second neighborhood of V and further, then the probability that the constraint is violated under mu is, ex is again exactly uh, this gamma thing. Okay, so this is kind of the connection with uh, the local lemma. Sorry? Oh yeah, so this is at most gamma, so yeah, okay. Okay. So uh, this was this gamma thing. And um, the second ingredient in the, in the theorem was this notion of causality, which basically says that a constraint violates another, con so, so we had this graph over constraints. or flaw, so each dot here is a constraint. Okay, and two constraints are, have an arc between each other, so it's C and uh, C prime. If there is a way to uh, try to fix C, and in the process violate C prime. Okay, so it turns out that uh, you can, because this is like a local algorithm, uh, you can see that, you vi that this graph has at most degree that is delta to the cubed, or in, right? Or it's, you know, some polynomial of delta. So I don't have to argue about it. And um, because of this, these are exponentially small in delta, so if gamma times the uh, causality degree is less than one over four, the theory of one over e, the theorem did apply, and this algorithm converges. Okay? Cool? Okay. So th this was max algorithm. And um, in the five minutes left, let me just tell you just one word about how, how one can see the proofs of these theorems. Okay? So this is not how this theorem was originally proved. But this is, um, is this my no, no, no. Uh, this convergence theorem. So this one with the gamma. How do you prove such things? So um, So it's two steps, right? In the first step, you show that uh, an algorithm converges and gives you something like this. Uh -huh. So this uses these observations and the theorem I, I just uh, with the gammas. So once you get this, then you fill everything. Then you fill everything. Okay. Or also write down what TGC is again. I think we were interested. What? What? What is? What? TGC. The number of contexts. So what is TGC? You write it down again. Uh.
Okay, so let me let me just say one word about how you can prove these theorems. Okay, so uh, so I'm trying to prove that a, a local search algorithm. Uh, where is it? I erase it. So I'm trying to prove that a local search algorithm that focuses on a constraint and does something to fix it converges. Okay, so one. Uh, one way to prove this, so because this is a Markov chain, so what I've drawn here is the transition matrix of the chain. Okay. Okay. So I'm rewriting the transition matrix of the chain, right? So that this is, so that, you know, this is a a, a, a number of, so this is like a, an omega by omega matrix, right? And here are the violating configurations. Okay. And here are the satisfying ones. Okay, for your CSP. And this is a transition matrix of the algorithm that tries to solve it. Okay? So it turns out what you need to show for convergence is that the spectral radius of A is less than one. Is bounded away from one. Okay. So if you show this, because when you keep applying the algorithm, then the probability that the algorithm has not terminated in t steps is guided by powers of a. Okay. What's the other here? It's a spectral radius of a. It's a row, right? So row. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> 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 Okay, so, and the observation is that A basically can be written as a, as a sum of matrices. So basically, because this is local search, A has a representation as a sum of sparse matrices. So when you expone, when you take the powers and you exponent this, right, and you, you know, do the expansion here, you take a sum over the kind of surviving sequences, OK, when you do this uh, explanation here. And the counting argument, like the one I showed you last time with the trees and stuff, shows that the sequences that survive in this summation, so the number of sequences, w, for which the product uh, is non zero, is basically is a, can be mapped to DRE trees. So if you can bound, so overall, so overall you get something like this. Sorry. Sorry? I'm trying to show that the spectral radius of this is less than one. And I'm saying, you know, think of powers of A. In fact, think of powers of any norm of A, because norms bound the spectral radius, OK? So I'm just, what I'm doing here, sorry. What I'm doing here is basically, I just write it as a sum of matrices. And this is guaranteed by the local nature of the algorithm. And I, exp uh, I expand this sum to a sum product, OK? So in the end, what you get with some counting and uh, is that uh, is that you want to bound is the number of surviving sequences times the maximum norm to the power of t. Okay, this by counting is at most e times delta to the t. Delta is here the the sparsity of the causality graph. And this is, a, it turns out th that this norm is exactly, what? It's the same me that came from counting trees last time. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so it's the same thing. And Sorry? Last time you were counting trees, you wrote like four instead of each. Oh, yeah, four. <laughs> okay, and this gamma, it, it, it turns out that, that this gamma is here, 
can be seen as uh, norms, but basically as the one norm of this of, of these matrices. Okay. So now the theorem says that if gamma is less than four of Alberta, this thing goes to zero. So the spectral radius is less than one, and this is why you get convergence. Cool. Yeah, that's all I have.